four ninety nine a pound. That's a pretty good price for fishing the round, especially perch. But in the Milwaukee area and other Great Lake cities, it's eighteen ninety nine. 19, 20, 20, sometimes as much as $22 a pound retail. I'm not sure what the wholesale product is, again, for the buyers and, and the fish brokers. But this is a common thing to see in the Milwaukee area. Uh, prob probably for the last 10 years, perch have been at re uh, retail price at a, at a fillet product. It's been around $16 a pound. Okay, uh, freshwater seafood supply barriers for the commercial harvest, which is now very, very limited in the Great Lakes region for yellow perch. It's primarily Lake Erie, Canadian and U.S. waters. Uh, some is coming out of Lake Huron, a little bit out of Green Bay, a minor amount coming out of Lake Ontario. Lake Superior, for the most part, is not a good environment for yellow perch. So you have closed seasons, quota, size limits, gear restrictions, and there's absolutely no harvest. Like in Lake Michigan, the commercial fishery for yellow perch was closed in 96, and it probably will never reopen again. And then you have fluctuating populations. In commercial aquaculture, you're limited, you know, because of the production of fingerlings, and the product use technology limits you, uh, the number of operations that are actually in business doing this, and then also in most cases the fresh market size product is only coming out of the chute at one time. And that's, you know, dependent on this here. And I have, a, on the left there, I have all kinds of freshwater fish that are available in the Great Lakes region. But as you can see, if you are going to depend on wild broodstock, or some kind of version of that. You have like maybe from early to mid-April to late May. And then after that, there's no more product available if you want to get eggs and incubate them and hatch them out. Next slide, please. Uh, so our, our interest was to develop the technology that would allow us to be able to spawn fish at any month of the 12-month calendar. And this was set out by developing domesticated broodstocks, manipulating the spawning cycles uh, to produce the gametes, produce healthy disease-free uh, disease fingerlings, and reduce, again, reduce your dependence on the wild broodstocks because that eventually is going to go away completely. Uh, the aquaculture toolbox, uh, we look at this whole thing, and Bell is also looking at it as a vertically integrated approach. Uh, genetic characterization of fin fish, we have done that work. Most of it has been completed. That work is under uh, the support of uh, USDA ARS. We have uh, Larry Chandler, Neil Martin, Jeff Silverstein, uh, Brian Shepard, and Chris Reese, uh, five USDA people here in the room. So if anyone wants to lobby them to get more money to give to myself and some of my other colleagues, Steve Summerfeld, or anywhere else, we'd be happy for you to do that. Uh, we're going to be looking at using these uh, improved fish as part of maybe even the out-of-cycle spawning approach, or perhaps using the progeny from these fish in these feeding trials to see if they will even perform better. And <clears throat> some of the other work, intensive aquaculture technology, I'm just going to touch on that very, very briefly. Next slide. Okay, when we do this out-of-cycle spawning, uh, we, initially we looked at just geographic strains, and we looked at fish that would spawn in somewhere between March and June you can find spawners. Now I said April to uh, late May, that's in the Great Lakes region here. If you want to expand that, you could go to the East Coast or you could go down to the Carolinas, and you could find yellow perch that are spawning as early as maybe late February, and that, that brings into play here this March through June. Uh, some of the examples of the strains that we have used are North Carolina, Green Bay, Lake Michigan, the size of your, your, or the age or, or size of the fish that you want to start with for developing <coughs> fruit stocks, you can start with eggs. Fingerlings, some adults or adults that are sexually mature. The best way to go, fertilize eggs, because then you're <coughs> addressing this whole issue of biosecurity, and you have all the life history information, and you control it better. Next slide. Okay, you need only a couple simple things to make this on a cycle spawning happen. You need light. I think most of you recognize that person, and you need temperature control. And the most important thing with temperature control is the cold temperature. And for those of you who don't recognize, that's some fan at Lambeau Field up in Green Bay. And if you watch the Packer game on Sunday, you'll probably get to see some of these crazy people. But temperature, cold temperature is really the key here. That you have to have this period of at least, let's say, 100 days of around 5 to 6 degrees centigrade. That will give you the best response. So you manipulate the photo period, you manipulate the temperature. The benefits for having this out of cycle spawning, again, for the, for the seafood buyers, is that you're going to have a product available for wherever this is being done. 
because you, you know we're confident that this technology now can be adopt, adapted to uh, year-round production every month of the calendar. Uh, let's see. This is what we've produced so far in the way of out of cycle spawners. We have uh, January, February, March, July, August, October, and December. We have fish spawning at those different months. And this is simply how you do it. This is an example of a Green Bay strain, not a, not a genetically characterized strain. This is one of the earliest ones that we did. Uh, they normally spawn in April, this time over here. But we want them to spawn in the summertime, so we shifted everything by four months. And what you end up doing then is getting them to spawn in August. And that, that particular strain performed really well for the first time, you know, uh, for this challenge of getting them to spawn on a cycle. Next slide. And it, it, here's the brood stock, and here are the eggs that are produced. These are either laid naturally by the fish in the tank, or you can actually go there and you can strip eggs. Without doing any kind of injections with uh, spawning hormones, uh, LHRH or HCG or anything like that, we have been able to compress the window for peak spawning to about three days. So we could go in and take fish out, handle them, strip them, fertilize them. Probably in three days we could do 250 to 300 females. Next slide, please. Now, when you get, if, if you have this out of cycle spawning technology, and you're even here in southern Indiana, or you're up in Wisconsin or Illinois, and you have perch spawning in January, and you get these young fish, the most important thing is you now have to have the technology to raise these fish, because you can't put them out in ponds in January. It just it doesn't work, and you know the reason for that. So right, right now, we're hung up on the research that's associated with getting these fish to feed at the onset of first feeding. And in our meeting this morning, for those of you that were there, you know, I tried to emphasize the fact that it's great to have these diets, and it's very important to have these diets from, let's say, 20 days post-hatch to fingerlings to sub-adults to adults, but fish aren't born big. And as a result, you have to feed them when they're very young. Next slide. And they will eat. But it's uh, wild food or live food, and it's expensive, and we're encouraged by some of the things that Rick Barrels has done, and now what the Steve Craig is working on with, with the pompano and the cobia. But we have to get a diet that's just like the trout diet. You buy the 50 or 40 pound bag, and you open it up, and you take a cup of that food and just dump it in the tank, or however you do it with feeders. But we don't have that right now for yellow perch. For yellow perch, we have to feed live food. We're fortunate that we only have to do it for about four days, and then we can switch them onto these other diets. But by day 25, we have them on a commercial, on a commercial diet. <clears throat> Next slide. And then you produce the fingerlings. This, again, is one of the bottlenecks. Uh, Bell's going to need, for their projections, they're going to need 25 million of these fish annually, which translates to about 8 million pounds of fillets. And this is not the easiest thing to do. And last slide. And this is what you end up with then for the Friday night fish fry. Who's, who's familiar with the Friday night fish fries? In the Great Lakes region here in these cities, whether it's Cleveland, Toledo, Albany, uh, it's a social and cultural event. And it started way back in the days when, uh, you know, meatless Fridays for the Catholics and they had fish fries in every tavern in the city and churches had them in their church hall and it's still going on today. When you pick up the, the paper at the Milwaukee Journal Central on Thursday, uh, nine out of ten advertisements for restaurants will be the Friday night fish fry. And as you can see from the product that's here, for the health food people who really like to eat healthy food and prepare their stuff as a baked product or a broiled product, perch were born to be fried. So keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.